On this episode, we take the new Mercedes-Benz GLB 250 into the woods to see if Boxier really is better. If you're a fan of boxy crossovers but still want that luxury experience, the new Mercedes-Benz GLB might be the small crossover you've been waiting for. You can get the new GLB in two distinct flavors, the high-strung 302 horsepower AMG edition or this, the 2021 GLB 250. The model we're testing today is loaded with more than $9,000 in factory options for a total price of $49,725 US dollars, including destination and delivery. Under the hood of the GLB 250 is a single powertrain option. This is a two liter inline four cylinder that's been turbocharged for up to 221 horsepower and 258 pound feet of torque. It's connected to an eight speed automatic dual clutch transmission and it powers all four wheels through Mercedes Formatic all wheel drive. EPA rates this setup at up to 30 miles to the gallon on the highway and 23 around town. Walking to the back and the boxy proportions really stand out. This is a quite different look from all the coupe styled crossovers that have been coming out of Germany. Using the motion sensor, I can open the rear gate with a wave of my foot. In the back, it has up to 22 cubic feet behind the second row. The GLB is available with a third row, which is unique for this class but our tester didn't come with it. Fold the seat down for up to 62 cubic feet of total storage. That is a significant increase over the GLA's 50.5 cubic feet of total capacity. The cargo floor includes a strap for easy access to tools and accessories. It even includes some flexible holders for small items. Now the second row of these little crossovers can sometimes be a challenge for a grown adult. Oh yeah, this isn't bad. Thanks to the boxy design, I have just buckets of headroom up here. I also get my own armrest and overly complicated cup holders that pop out. Down here, five volt USB-C and AC power. The only thing I'm really missing is my own aircon control. But at this price point in a Mercedes, usually you're just not gonna get that. Gotta move up to the next in the class. Moving up front and yeah, it's a Mercedes. You have that trademark design language, which really I think it's quite extraordinary. Just the design of these vents and this steering wheel. Now, the steering wheel is an optional AMG unit. This isn't what comes with the base car. The GLB starts at about 40 grand. This one has $10,000 in options. So if you go down to the store and you say, I just want to see a basic GLB, it's not going to look like this. It's powered on. Oh yeah, this has the dual 10 and a quarter inch display system that I absolutely love. Now this isn't the easiest system to learn how to use, but if you kind of soak in it for a couple weeks, you start to get pretty good at it. On the left is the main gauge cluster and it is of course all digital. We have lots of configuration options here and we have this really cool touch sensitive trackpad where I can adjust the display to my liking. And if I want to go a little bit deeper, I hit the home button and it brings up an even deeper menu of options. And this is also where I can change the overall design. And unlike some vehicles where when you change the gauge cluster, that's all that changes, this one also changes the design in the center display. Like the gauge cluster, there is a left to right master menu and you can control it with the haptic feedback touchpad down here, or you can also just touch it on the screen. Now, I prefer to use the touchpad when convenient, although sometimes I do just want to jab the screen because I, I really just don't like fingerprints on my display, and this way we can avoid doing that. Let's just work left to right because there's a lot to cover here. First off, there's a phone. You can do mobile device integration. There is Bluetooth for hands-free. Going over to navigation, this one has 
of course, yet another upgrade, and that is augmented reality turn-by-turn -turn instructions. It'll actually take a camera view from the safety system and impose it with arrows. It's really cool. I'll show that to you later. But let's go ahead and do a quick search just to see how well this works. Now, this is where touching the screen is really useful. Yes, I can stroke out letters here, but I'd much rather just poke up here. Let's do Cafe Vita. Yet another cafe. Okay, let's try a voice search. Find Cafe Ladro. Nothing. Starbucks. Oh, well, it can find Starbucks. Obviously, the man is again siding with big corporate coffee. Oh, well, let's go ahead and <laughs> navigate there. And boom, very easy, gives you lots of information and the display is crystal sharp and looks amazing. You can also switch between two-dimensional and three-dimensional views. Oh, we can find parking in the vicinity. Lots of good options here. So moving across the menu structure, next we have radio. Here I can pick terrestrial and then it also of course supports Sirius XM and all the channels. I do like how I can just quickly flick left to right between the channels. I don't have to have presets. So if I'm not really sure what I want to listen to, it's very easy to just kind of browse. Moving along, we have media integration, and this is where we can plug in the iPhone. Yes, certain Mercedes do support wireless CarPlay. This is not one of them. Um, this is a cabled only connection, and it does support USB-C. Obviously, it also supports Android Auto. Now, there is a couple funny things. First off, I gotta unlock my device for the first use. Great. I'm not sure why there's such big black bars. It hasn't been reformatted to the wide display like you get in the Audi Q3. Uh, this one, it just kind of feels like they shoehorned it in there because literally it is shoehorned into a box, but it does have all the functionality and it is set up for either touchpad or screen. I find the screen actually works way better. It's not as responsive with the touchpad as I would like. So there's that. If I want to do a CarPlay search, I can just hold the button up here. Find Cafe Ladro. One possibility I see is Cafe Ladro on Urban Plaza in Kirkland. And it finds it no problem. Boom, there we go. Next we have Comfort. There's not a lot to adjust in here, but it is significant. There is Seat Kinetics, which isn't seat massagers, just so you don't make that mistake. What it does is it slightly adjust the seat while you're driving so that your body doesn't stay too static for too long, which kind of helps on long drives. Um, I don't know, it's, it's there. <laughs> but the bigger thing here is the ambient lighting, and this is equipped with the optional ambient lighting package. And you can do a lot of stuff with this in terms of lighting. You can go from a multicolor display to a multicolor animation. I can pick pre-designed templates like ocean blue, and what it does is it changes the colorized highlight pieces in the vehicle. And it's actually pretty cool because they don't just have one or two strips here. No, this entire vehicle is equipped with these color accents, even inside the vents. It's just kind of a fun thing. Yeah, it's kind of useless, but I think it's cool, you know? And you can adjust it if you want it brighter or darker. And right now I have it set to animate, so it's going between purples and blues. Next, we have the info screen. Here on the info screen, we have lots of stuff to look at. We can look at vehicle data, engine data. This basically gives us extended gauges in a very kind of cool way. Fuel consumption, graphs, all that kind of stuff. Uh, moving along, we have Mercedes apps. If you want to do restaurants, cafe list, if you want to open up a web browser for some reason. I do kind of like the weather app in here. It's pretty complete and even gives you ski information if that's what you're into, which is good because this vehicle is actually equipped with winter tires. They rarely equip press cars with winter tires, so we're gonna use those a little bit later. And then finally, we have settings. This is where you can enable and disable things like traction control, hill descent control. Those are also shortcutted with a button down below, but this also gives the full list of all of the active safety that is equipped on this vehicle has traffic sign information, active brake assist, which is the collision mitigation, attention assist to make sure that you're not, you know, wobbling too much. It will notify you about traffic lights, blind spot assist, and that's basically it. 
This does not have adaptive cruise control. It does not have lane detection. It really is lacking some what I think are fundamentals, especially in a vehicle that purports to be a luxury car. Um, I would expect this stuff missing from lower end cars, but the fact is, is that most lower end cars, yep, they include it all standard now. So I think it's time for the luxury guys to kind of get on board and start doing the same. Uh, they've milked that money train for a long time and I, I think it's time for them to get over it. Speaking of rear view camera, go into reverse, it flips up in the back to keep it clean, gives you a boxed view. I would like it to fill the whole display, but I guess that's what we get. The color is nice, resolution's a little bit on the low side. Put it back into park, it folds back up. Now let's talk about this interior. The steering wheel, I love this AMG steering wheel. It is optional and I think it should come on every single GLB. The metal pieces, the paddle shifters, the leather, the stitching, it really is one of the great steering wheels. And of course you have a lot of functionality integrated in a very small space and it works really well. I think it's one of the better integrations. The seat is on the firm side. You do have really good lateral support. Controls are on the door like most Mercedes vehicles and it has three stages of heat. No seat coolers at this trim level. Visibility is pretty good. There is no way to flip down the back headrest so those are in the way sometimes. I do believe that some of this interior is excellent and some of it is eh. The excellent, I like the carbon fiber pieces with the LED accents, the metal, the metal. There is piano black, but it's not in a high touch point area. So I'm actually okay with it right here. I'm not fond of it down here. The piano black down here is clearly gonna scratch a lot as you're fumbling or throwing keys uh, into the cup holder area. Also, no wireless charging pad. Now granted, it doesn't have wireless CarPlay, but at this price point for a luxury car, wireless charging, kind of a thing that I think it should just have. Let's talk about some of the details on this system and what we're gonna do today. Uh, this does have a turbocharged four cylinder. It's attached to a dual clutch eight speed automatic transmission with those paddle shifters. Well, actually those feel pretty good. And it does have four Matic all wheel drive. Four Matic I have done a deeper dive video on called Four Matic Explained. You might wanna check that out. And that goes into the details of how Formatic works. Now, what we're gonna do today is really push this GLB and see exactly how Formatic works on this vehicle. And you have a little bit of control over how the power is put down with the dynamic control system. That lets you do everything from individual where you can customize the engine, the adjustable damping suspension, the steering and the traction control, or you can do preset programs like Sport where it's gonna really make the throttle much, much punchier, uh, to comfort where it kind of makes it a little more lethargic, to eco where it's really trying to eke out the best MPGs possible. And then there's an off-road mode and that gives you the softest suspension. It's gonna dumb down the throttle just a little bit to kind of make it a little bit slower so you're not gonna be as twitchy. And then it's also gonna optimize the traction control system. Let's uh, pull right over here and I'll show you how those systems differ on a slippery gravel surface. And then we head on the freeway on the way to the mountains. Oh, yep, shifting on the stock, it's so weird. In sport mode, you can see power get pushed to the rear wheels only after it's had a full rotation of the wheel. Still, it does manage to kick up some gravel, which is surprisingly aggressive. Next, in comfort mode, there appears to be a little bit more nose lift, thanks to the adjustable suspension, but an otherwise similar result from the all-wheel drive. Finally, in off-road, it's really more of the same. This shows that there's very little practical difference between these different dynamic settings in terms of performance.
And jumping on the freeway, we can feel the power of the Turbo 4. Certainly makes some fun noises. Gets us up to speed quickly. The shifts from the 8-speed dual-clutch transmission are pretty clean, actually. Some dual-clutch transmissions are a little bit jolty. This one doesn't seem to have that problem. It seems to be very well sorted. Now, on the all-wheel drive gauge, I can tell that while I'm cruising here, all the power is going to my front wheels. But when I lay in the throttle, I get a little bit of power to the back because, obviously, at 70 miles an hour, you just don't need a full 50-50 split. When we get into the mountains, we'll definitely see more power going to the back, and we'll report on that. Just like you would expect a Mercedes, it's actually fairly quiet on the freeway, even for a small car. This piece of pavement is particularly loud, and I'm finding it very pleasant in here. The feel of the steering wheel is excellent. Visibility is great because it's basically an aquarium. Yeah, this is pleasant. I like this. The only problem here is the fact that this test car did not come with adaptive cruise control and lane detect. It didn't. Even at nearly 50 grand, it doesn't have it. To get that, you need to spend uh, another $1,700 on the driver assistance package. So all we get here is standard cruise control, which is kind of okay, but really, when a Camry includes it in the base trim, you can't put it on a Mercedes GLB. I think someone's being stingy. The GLB is slotted right between the GLA and the GLC, as the name would indicate. It's basically a GLA that's been supersized with boxy proportions, and it makes it look much bigger on the outside than it really is. This is kind of a subcompact plus, I guess you could say. But even the definition of what a subcompact is keeps growing, so, you know, the terms are becoming a little bit vague. This is a subcompact like the Ford Bronco Sport is a subcompact. I don't think it really is. I absolutely love these dual displays. It is like one of the best systems ever, and they're so clear, and they're so easy to read, and you have so many configuration options. It does not come on the base trim, but I think that this is definitely a splurge that is worth it. Customize, swipe to the right, let's look at tack, all-wheel drive data, safety data, ooh, G-Force, whoa, it's always useless but fun, you can put a map up there which is cool, and just so many great options, it really allows you to configure this vehicle to your own personal tastes, and I like that, not sure what kind of weather we're going to get today, I see snow still up in the mountains, we might hit some of that, and if we do, I will not be afraid because we are rolling on snow tires. Yeah, we're kind of near the end of the season, and for some reason, this is the first set of snow tires we've received on a press car. For those who don't know, if you haven't been watching us a lot, I feel like I kind of need a recap. We test these vehicles with the tires they provide to us, and we are not allowed to switch the tires, and technically, they really don't want us to even change the tire pressures. So we really need to be pushed up against the wall before we even air down a tire, even in an off-road setting. So. You just have to keep that in mind. We have limitations with what we're able to do with these press cars, and we definitely push the envelope as much as we can. The augmented reality system here uh, will use the cameras from the collision mitigation system to show me a view and then superimpose data on top of the real world view. It's really cool. So as I'm coming up to the turn here, it should switch into a camera mode and then tell me to make the turn. But I'm not gonna make the turn, I'm gonna miss it. Look at that, it has an animated set of arrows. And then as I drive past it, it's then going to try to reroute me here. As I come up to the turn, the camera turns on, it gives an arrow superimposed and then shows me in the real world environment with animation where I'm supposed to go next. That is really awesome. I just love that stuff. That is so cool. Because it's not just technology for technology's sake, it's actually useful. That is really useful. Ooh, power is quick. 
You know, I really love this engine. It just has a great torque curve. It sounds good. And it's just perfectly mated with this eight-speed dual clutch transmission. And if I want to go, let's say, let's switch into sport mode, then it becomes even more peppy. And then I can use the paddle shifters here to quickly shift between gears. Let's see how quick this goes. It's relatively quick, about as much as you would expect in a non-sports car SUV. Our test car is equipped with the optional adaptive suspension. What that does is it changes the damping rate depending on which dynamic mode you're in. So in sport, it is going to be the firmest. And it's never really too firm. In fact, I would say it's not firm enough. I would kind of almost like it to be a little firmer, but it does give you some nice positive feedback and it is, it always keeps the ride comfortable, which is kind of what you want in a vehicle of this class. Again, not a sports car. Doesn't need to pretend to be one. Let's try a zero to 60. I'm gonna come to a complete stop right here going to put the dynamic mode into sport so we have the best opportunity there's nothing else really to do I'm going to preload a little bit three two one go oh yeah there we go feel that much quicker off the line and 60 6.56 seconds okay that's pretty good now let's head into the woods switching into off-road really softens up the suspension so it can really take in those impacts it also optimizes the all-wheel drive system for trickier situations. We'll see how it deals with our challenge course a little bit later. So how is it to drive on forest roads at speed? Woo! Ha! Yeah, you can't really rotate it because primarily front-wheel drive, but the suspension is set up nicely for this. And of course, since it has no tires on it, you actually get pretty good grip. Well, we're not here to blaze trails. We're gonna go see what this all-wheel drive system is capable of. We're gonna hit the trail and uh, see if we can lift traction off a couple wheels. And I do not know what the weather is like up there. Um, I saw some snow in the lowlands and it might be low enough that it might be covered in snow. I hope it is. Unlike the GLA, which is basically made for urban street use, this one actually has 7.9 inches of ground clearance, which isn't bad. So you could say this is a more rugged, boxy version. It's kind of like a little mini G-Wagon. Okay, maybe that's going a little too far, but it is boxy, it is a Mercedes, and it does have all-wheel drive. Yeah, but no locking differentials, no height adjustable suspension. Okay, it doesn't have any of that, but let's go in and see how it does. So far, no snow, at least on the main track. This lower section will give us a good opportunity to kind of get a taste of what this all-wheel drive system is capable of. Now, I'm in off-road mode already, and let's see how it does. So I'm just slowly approaching. These are 19-inch wheels, so I need to be careful not to scrape them. Mercedes hates it when I scrape their wheels. Okay. And it's a fine line between maintaining momentum and bashing a nose. A little bit of slip there. This is a 16% grade. And I'm on a 5 degree tilt. Okay, a little fussing there. Snow tires kind of spun a little bit. Now it's interesting. Every time I come up here, it's a little bit different. That's because a lot of vehicles drive through here. Uh, it's actually had a lot of snow recently, and I'm kind of surprised there's no snow on it today. There was so much snow here just a few days ago. Mountain life, yo. Okay, let's go ahead and stop and see what we got here. The course looks like it actually has deteriorated a little bit over the winter. All the snow on it and all the vehicles going up and down it and getting stuck and getting unstuck, it really shifts the terrain. So this is gonna be interesting. Hit drive, make sure that I'm in dynamic mode off-road. So I have optimizations with my throttle and my traction control, as well as the suspension. And away we go.
It's kind of funny that I finally have a vehicle equipped with snow tires and there's no snow. But snow tires do give us an advantage in dirt and rock. They have a slightly better grip than a traditional all season. So this section right up here, I'm gonna take traction off the front and back wheels there. And yeah, momentum is how you would get through this normally, but I wanna see how the all wheel drive system responds. Okay, I'm putting throttle in. It's shifting power by applying brakes to the wheels and putting me forward. Okay, let's try that again. And this time I'm gonna look at the all wheel drive display. So I'm going very slow. I see a little power going to the back. Okay, now that I'm shifting, oh, power is going there. Lots of power going to the back passenger side. More power is going up there. No power is going on the wheel that has, you know, a foot of air under it. <laughs> I just keep my foot in the throttle and away we go. Just like it's supposed to do. So now we're at a 17% grade. And that is percent, not degrees. Oh, come on, you can do it. It's doing a really good job of avoiding putting power where it's not needed. We're at a 20% here. Oh, gonna get over, oh man. It's just kind of lacking power here. 20%, 21. Okay, this is a tricky one. Uh, I go hard to the right or I go easy to the left, but I cannot go down the middle because there's a boulder that's too big. So let's go hard to the right because we got through everything else. As I go in, I have to go super slow because I don't want to hear grinding. Can I do it? And we're up. So it did fuss a little bit, but ultimately it was able to tackle that hill. And I think it did a pretty good job. It, it did what it's supposed to do, shifting power around, using brakes to redistribute power into the system, giving it to the wheels that had grip. Bravo. Oh, finally, snow. Should we do a bonus round? So the next leg is actually covered in snow. And not a little bit, that's a lot of snow. And it's compacted and icy. It's kind of like driving on ice cubes, essentially. This is really gonna be a test for the all-wheel drive system, not just because of the ice, of which there is a lot of it here, but also the undulations and the change in terrain will really remove traction off of one or more wheels. Actually, in this case, I might have traction off of three wheels at a time. but ice is still slippery either way. Okay, got a lot of traction going to the front. Just creeping along. I'm going super slow because I'm really concerned about kicking up boulders. And it is having a heck of a time with this sludge. Oh, we got a big dip on the left. I'm actually gonna straddle it a little bit because this only has 7.9 inches of ground clearance and let's not push it. I am, however, losing traction on the right side because of the ice and snow pushing a lot of power to that back rear wheel. It can do up to 50% to the back, so it's never gonna be a huge amount, but it's, it's enough to get us through things. And that really is the whole point of these systems. It's not, oh, come on, are you gonna do it? Oh, 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 it is trying really hard and I'm trying to go super slow because I don't wanna bash my nose. We're at a 19%, 20% grade on ice. Come on, you gonna do it? I'm gonna cut a little bit to the left here, reading the terrain. Am I gonna get up it? Am I gonna get up it? Come on, this is the tough part right here. I'm just keeping the throttle in, letting it sort itself out, but that's not enough apparently. Let's roll back a little bit. This is a 25% grade right now. Okay, and go. Can you do it, can you do it? Oh, 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 yes forward. Oh, there we go. Rock it through, rock it through, rock it through. Throttle. It's letting me spin my tires like, and it shut down. Ladies and gentlemen, the Mercedes has had enough. Shut it off. 
turn it back on. Huh. Okay. Well, I was able to get it back on. It didn't like all that wheel spin, probably because this is a dual clutch transmission and they don't like that a lot. But still, it accomplished quite a lot. But I'm really kind of not happy about that shutdown. Shutdowns can be dangerous. If you're on the edge of a cliff and you need to keep that momentum going through, if your car shuts down, that's a problem. The GLB 250 did a great job of managing that tricky situation. That said, during testing, it did shut down on me once. Though there were no error messages, I did figure that it was to prevent the dual clutch transmission from overheating, which is disappointing, but not surprising considering we've had similar issues with other DCT equipped vehicles in the past. They simply have trouble in these kind of situations. The GLB 250 did start back up immediately, which allowed me to do one final test. The GLB does have hill descent control. Of course, I can't turn it on when I'm in reverse. I have to turn it off again. So I just select DSR and then I can pick my speed. Let's do one mile per hour. The question is, does it work in reverse? So let's see how nicely it eases us down this incline. Oh, so the benefit of a hill descent system is that it will proactively apply individual wheel brakes to keep the vehicle tracking correctly uh, downhill, especially on steep climbs like we have here. That's a little on the quick side. If you are using just the regular brakes, you're stomping on the brakes, it's applying brakes to all four unless it starts to feel slip and then it'll apply the ABS system. This one is a lot more aggressive in how it applies ABS and it makes it really easy to go down super steep inclines. And I love the fact that you can set individual speeds and boy, that that's a, sounds so loud, which is great. That's how you know it's working. For Driving Sports TV, I'm Ryan Douthat. Thanks for watching. This is really a nicely equipped little car. It didn't do perfect up the hill climb, but for what people are going to use this for, I think it is more than enough. For Driving Sports TV, I'm Ryan Douthat. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe, leave a comment. We'll see you again right here next week. Unless, of course, we get stranded up on a mountain, in which case, send pizza and help. <laughs>